appreciate you guys so much. In 1 Timothy 4 and 12, this is a word that the Lord uh, put on my heart this week uh, to share with you. And I want, uh, it's entitled, Be an Example. Be an Example. I highlighted there on the screen for you the word exam. Because in the word example is the word exam. As a Christian, people have the right to exam you, to put you to the test, to see what it is that you are doing in life. My goal as a pastor is to equip the body of Christ so that we're able to go out and to speak the word and to be strong in the Lord. And I know today that the one great thing that is lacking in the church and outside the church today is a right example. Is people living close to God and living close to his word, adhering to it, and living what it says. How many of you feel like that's important to do? It is not just important, it's essential that we do that. And it takes discipline in our hearts. And Paul, writing to a young evangelist named Timothy, there was nobody like Timothy to Paul. I don't, I don't care whoever it was, if it was Silas or whoever it was, nobody was like his son in the faith, Timothy. He shared with the, the believers in Galatians and the Ephesians that when he came to them, he had the same heart as he did and that he could have that confidence in him. But here, he's encouraging him, and he's trying to bolster him and, 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 and help him to understand the realities of being a Christian. And he says in 1 Timothy 4 and 12, Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Well, I guess that scripture don't apply to me, or at least the young part don't anymore. But it, it, he's saying, because you're young, Timothy. But listen what he says. Be an example to all believers. In what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. I want to speak that last part again. In what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. That's a pretty big job, amen? But it's something that we can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me start the message off today by asking you a possible rhetorical question, but one that needs to be answered in our lives. Are we supposed to care what people think of us? Are we? You know, I've heard people, you know, they go along in this old brash, I don't care what people think about me, bless God. I am what I am. If they don't like it, it's tough. You ever heard people say, maybe you even said that every now and then in life, you know. I don't care. But is it important to care what other people think about us? I think the answer to that question is both yes and no. Yes, it is, and no, it isn't. And for us, we have to determine that avenue so that we can remain viable and strong for the Lord. If this question were important at all then Paul would not have penned this verse in the Bible if 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 what people thought about us if they looked upon us and it didn't matter what they thought then Paul would have never instructed Timothy to uh, be an example in what you say how you live your love your faith and your purity so there is a yes factor to that but there's a no factor to that also the no factor is, is that we are not to let people's opinion of us override our ability to do the right thing no matter the cost or the consequences. So there's the no factor. So There's always going to be somebody that's not going to think well of you or have a good thoughts about you. But you're not to allow those things to hinder how you conduct yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. They may not have a good opinion of you because of your strong faith in God, but you're still not to let that in that way hinder them. Oftentimes I've seen this, and I want to deal with this for a few moments.
because it deals with our conduct. Oftentimes, Christians use some type of outlandish logic to justify bad behavior or being a bad example. And we have a neat way of cloaking it, oftentimes, so that it looks spiritual. The first thing I've seen people say and heard people say before, you know, and, and this is talking about your life and your conduct to the world and to people around you, they'll say something like, it's nothing personal, it's just business. It's nothing personal, it's just business. How many of you ever heard people say that in life? What are they saying when they use a terminology like this? They're trying to separate their Christianity from their daily affairs. It's nothing personal. You know, you might have cheated someone or done something, but it's nothing personal. It's just business. Be careful how we allow our conduct to be assessed by other people in life. You cannot separate your Christian conduct from your daily lives and say something like it's nothing personal. It's just business. Christianity is not a garment that you put on and take off when it's most convenient to do so. It is a life that is lived 24-7 in the church and in your community. Amen? You know, I mean, if you just come to church, say, I'm in church, I'm going to act like a church person. And then you go outside and you say, well, I'm in the world, I'm going to act like the world. That is not setting a good example for the world. It, it's, it's nothing personal. Yes, it is personal. It's personal because you have been ordained by God to be a light unto this world. One that draws other people to know Jesus Christ. Secondly, I see people in a biblical way. You, you know, you ever look for a biblical way to tell other people to shut up? You know, because we don't want to get too coarse and crude by saying, hey man, won't you just shut up? But when people are you know, maybe calling us to an account for something. They confronted us even over some of our shortcomings or our failings. One of the things that a lot of Christians want to jump back and do is say, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Because if you judge me, you're going to be what? Judged. It's a way of saying, shut up. You know, you ain't got no right to say anything to me. Don't judge me because you're going to get what you're going to get if you continue to judge me in that way. How many of you know that the principle of judging is probably one of the most abused subjects and doctrines in the Bible? It's the most misunderstood and unclearly presented oftentimes because we just, it's like people freeze when they say that. They say, don't judge me. You go like, oh boy, I can't judge them in life. Well, look, the definition of judge means this. To form an opinion about through careful weighing of evidence and testing of that evidence as to the grounds and foundation upon which it is formed. So when you're judging something, you're careful. You're not hasty in doing that. You, you form an opinion through careful weighing of evidence and testing of that evidence as to what its grounds and foundations are upon which it is formed. We are told um, to judge in the Bible, but not to judge from self-righteousness. You see, that's the key. We're told to judge. We're supposed to judge. It's commanded that we judge in the Word of God, but never from a self-righteous perspective, meaning that as you judge others, you yourself are not living the life. As you judge others, you are not conforming to that which you are condemning somebody else for. Or you're making yourself to look better because you want to feel superior than someone else, so you judge or demean them. Matthew 7 and verse 20 says this, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so can so you can identify people by their action. You are a tree, if you want to look at it that way. You are a tree that walks out of this church. And every tree has a fruit when we're talking about bearing something for the Lord. And when you walk out into your community or wherever you go, people are looking at your fruit. And the Bible says if the tree, if the fruit is rotten, 
if it is not what it should be, the tree is bad. But if that fruit is good, the tree itself is good. And he says, you're supposed to have the discernment and the judgment to do that. But at the same time, you know that others are looking at your example as to how you are leading and conducting your life. And if they see fruit on our tree that is not aligning with the Word of God, how many of you know we are putting ourselves in a place of rebuke? And don't drop back and say, don't judge me. What we need to do is have the humility in our lives to be able to say, I am sorry. I was not living the life that I should have lived before you. Will you forgive me in life? Man, that's novel, isn't it? Praise the Lord that we should do that as a part of our conduct in life. So, be careful how you use, don't judge me. I've heard people use something to keep the measuring stick off of them on this one. They'll say, there's nothing illegal about what I'm doing. Ain't nothing illegal about what I'm doing. Man, that is a raunchy excuse. Amen. There ain't nothing illegal about what I'm doing. How many of you know it's not illegal to cheat on your spouse? It used to be in some places, but I don't think it really is anymore. But it's not illegal. But how many know it's not morally right? Amen? So don't use this thing because the United States law doesn't condemn it that I, you, you know, I can do it because it's not illegal uh, in the nation. How many of you know it's fundamentally not illegal to lie to somebody? You lie to their face, lie here, lie there, tell this lie. Now, I wouldn't suggest doing that under oath in the court, you know, or anything of that nature. But as far as lying in general, there's no law that says I can't lie to you, you can't lie to one another. But is it right? Absolutely not. It's not illegal to gossip about your neighbor or to gossip about somebody in church. Or to gossip here and to gossip there. There's nothing illegal about gossip. But is it right? No, it's not right. And we need to understand the example that we are supposed to be leading for one another. I have some people, I've heard people over the years use a way of their example and their conduct in the community of saying something like, well, it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, what you did to me, I'm going to do to you. If you give me this, I'm going to give you that back. You know, I, how many of you know that that kind of system actually went away with the law in, in that sense the way? We're under a thing called G-R-A-C-E. What is that called? Grace. Amen. And so we, we have people that do that. How many of you know what the golden rule is? Do as do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. How many of you do that in your life every day? Think about how you want others to treat you and do for you. Do you give them the same benefit in life? I wish I stood that test a little bit better sometimes than what I do. But that's the rule that we're supposed to live by. In Romans 12 and 19, Paul gives us some insight in how we are to deal with one another. Romans 12 and 20. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, do what? If they're thirsty, do what? Give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals of shame on their heads. Do not let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing what? good. Amen. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth does not accomplish the works of God. Doing to somebody else what they do to you in return is not magnifying the spirit and the character of God. You say, you mean, I'm, if somebody injures me, I'm supposed to bless them? That's what the word says. The word says if somebody slap you in the, on one side of the face, what, would, what, what is he asking you to do? Let, let them have the other one too. Dear Lord, they fighting grounds out of that first slap. Hallelujah. I don't know whether I would, could do another one. But what he's saying there, I, do away with 
the imagery there. He's just simply saying if someone offends you, you know, don't take it so personally. Let the love of God shine, and if it continues to be an offense, that they have to turn the other cheek to give the witness uh, and the glory unto God, do it. Do it. Am I preaching too plain this morning? You see, this is a reminder to live, to be an example unto all people that we are called to live in front of. Another thing that I hear people say when they want to justify bad conduct or the way that they've been acted is, is, is they say, well, those people are not Christians. How do you know? I see, I hear this so many times out of people, and literally it just sets something off inside of me to when somebody wants to justify bad behavior or saying something about the other side or the other person, they say they ain't Christians. How do you know? How do you see their heart? How do you know what it is that, that they are living or not living? And to be able just to drop somebody in a category that suits your moment and suits whatever it is you're trying to justify by trying to say if they did something they shouldn't have done, that they're not a Christian, therefore you're justified in giving them some type of raunchy feedback that's not really should be there. Think about that. So we can just treat them like a dog. We can just treat them like the Jews treated the Samaritans. They treated them as dogs because they were half-breed. They, they didn't think they belonged or had a place in the kingdom of God. I thought, now I may be wrong, but I thought it was these people that were doing wrong that we were supposed to try to win to Jesus. I thought that they were the people that we were supposed to be setting an example for of grace and mercy and kindness and love to bring them to know Christ. Not just saying, well, these people ain't Christians and we can just do anything we want to do with them. Listen, here's a fresh thought. Just because someone disagrees with what you think or believe does not mean they're not a Christian. All oh, that you just got to let that just sink way in. There's people going to disagree with you and people not going to believe like you. And if all you do is just write them off and just say they ain't a Christian because they believe different or they have different thoughts or opinions. Listen, it could be that you're wrong. It could be that you're deceived. It could be. Oh, I know. I wouldn't dare suggest that to any of y'all because I can see on your faces we're all right, right? Right? Amen. We got halos today. Praise the Lord. But you could be wrong when it comes to a situation in life. It could be that you are wrong. You see, there were people in the church at Corinth in the first Corinthians that were not acting like Christians. They were accepting of a man who was having sexual relationships with his stepmother. And Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians to correct this. But what did Paul do? You read his letter. Paul treated and dealt with them as brothers and sisters in Christ. They were thinking that it was okay. They had gotten haughty and prideful and high-minded and thought that this was okay. He had them to excommunicate the offender because he had to be removed in order to see his sin and to repent of that sin. But he didn't say all these other people weren't Christians. He didn't say that they were lost and on their way to hell. He came to bring discipline to them in love, in the power of the Holy Spirit to restore them. How many of you know that you have, according to Paul in the Word of God, a ministry of reconciliation? Your job and my job is to reconcile the lost and the deceived and the hurting. But you've got to walk the best you can in the character and the love and the power of the Holy Spirit in order to be able to have their confidence to be able to reconcile them. It's so important. We wonder why the church has lost its power, has lost its authority, has lost its standing in the community today. Because in many ways, we've lost an edge of our love. We've lost an edge of our sacrifice. We've lost an edge of, of putting others before ourselves. Amen? These were people who needed discipline in Corinthians. 
to bring their hearts back in line with God's word. I see people out there in other denominations that don't believe like I believe. I don't count them as heathens. I don't count them as people who are against me. There's things that I want to teach and preach and do that I think that they ought to bring to light because it's in the word of God. But I see greatly more than anything they're missing things that they could have if they would simply dive in and enjoy it. But are they my brothers and sisters? If they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they are. Amen? Amen. I've known people, literally, who have been back blacklisted by their churches for divorce. I've talked to people over the years that because they got a, a divorce, and while I don't believe in divorce, it definitely is not the unpardonable sin. Amen? They treat people like they have a plague. They treat people like all of a sudden they're the off scouring of the world. I know I've worked with people like this, and they've told me personally that they were excommunicated from this or this committee or that committee or this place or that place of influence because something happened outside of their control. Be careful about the example that we set in life. Amen? Even if you're right, be careful with your attitudes. It's so important that we know, that we do that. The Apostle Paul he modeled an attitude towards lost people that we all somehow need to get a taste of. When I read this, I, my mind is blown. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 2, Paul talking about his own people. He said, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, for my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Wow! He's saying, if the Lord would just cut me off, curse me, and that would save the whole nation of the Jews, I'd be willing to do it. What a love for lost people. What a place to insert yourself in there and say, if I could take that, then I would for them. It shows the heart. I think, lastly, on these attitudes that I've seen before is... When we justify our bad behavior sometimes in this example, some people will say, well, when I get angry, it's righteous anger. Oh, yeah. Yeah, buddy. My anger is righteous. Amen. Mm, I can just feel the holiness in that when I say it. Praise the Lord. Righteous anger. You know, it's, it, it's the kind we'll say that Jesus did when he braided that whip and he caught the money changers in the temple who were cheating people by taking from them to sell sacrifices to them that were either maimed or overpriced or whatever. And Jesus got angry. You know what the Bible says there. He braided the whip and he went after He turned over the money changers' tables. And there's this group of people that says, well, if Jesus could do that, bless the Lord, I can do that in my life. Look. I'm just going to take a guess at this. But I think if you and I could be completely honest today, a good portion of our anger has nothing to do with righteousness. Man, I just had a flash. All of a sudden, halos just started flicking like the battery was going dead or something. I was like, oh, they need some juice or some power. Most of our righteousness or our anger sometimes is not righteous we need to be very careful and i mean very careful when we add the word righteous to our anger never do that lightly never add that word without careful consideration when you use it with the word anger remember the word righteousness means to be right in the sight of god and that means if your anger that you're attaching righteousness to, it means that what you're about to do is right in the sight of God. Yeah. It just kind of changes things a little bit, doesn't it? In John 16 and 2, 
He said, for you will be expelled from the synagogues, talking to his disciples. And the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service to God. Think about that. Here's folks going to you know, have an okay corral gun shoot because their righteous anger don't like you and for the things that you're doing. And he's talking about the people, the synagogues, the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders of these places. He said they'll expel you and put you out of church. In fact, they'll even go as far to kill you and tell everybody else and justify we did it because God wanted us to do it. Deceit. Deceit. Jesus quickly condemned his own zealous disciples who were ready to sanitize their misplaced anger by framing it as a righteous cause. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 54 and 55, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, where they see that the Samaritans did not welcome Jesus, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? just as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. I mean, think of this. His disciples, and I'm thinking, Lord, I don't even measure up to half of what they were. And all of a sudden, their greatest illusion was for God to send fire down and barbecue these people. I mean, that was how he was going to get rid of his problem. And he felt good about it. Lord, just give the word and we'll do like Elijah said and just say, we'll dispose of these people quickly. Careful how we operate in so-called righteousness in life. It's self-righteousness oftentimes in our lives. Now, let me, let me deal with our text for a few moments. Paul commands us in our text to be an example in what you say. Be an example in what comes off your tongue to other people. Proverbs 18, 20 through 21, or verse 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. The power of life or death is in your tongue. You can build up or destroy. You can encourage or you can run down. You have and I have that power. When other people see us at a counter somewhere running down a waitress or running down a cashier who didn't have anything to do with what happened in the kitchen and we're just, just raking them over the coals, what, what do you think that says? When, when they see us acting, you know, stupid on the road, you know, weaving in and out and getting on somebody's tail and trying to push them off the road. What does that tell us? I had a man in my church one time that he got so angry in a road, road rage accident over here in Oakwood. They pulled off of the side of the road and both of them got out. And before you know it, he had him in a headlock rolling around on the main exit out there going into. And, and what was so funny about it, he told me, he said, the only thing I could think of when I was slamming him in the head was, he says, you got it, Toyota. I don't know what in the world that had to do with anything, but he had that commercial on his mind is all I know. But I mean, that quick. <laughs> it happened. I'm telling you the truth. Be careful what you say. Ephesians 4 and 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. It's wrong to cuss. <laughs> I said it's a sin to cuss. Why, why do you need to? God's people are not idiots. They have a language to speak. We don't need to blanking people out and blanking them this and blanking them that. Don't use. He said, don't use foul or abusive. Language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Amen. That's what he wants us to do. Psalm 19, 14. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When you look at that scripture, you've got to understand that what you meditate in your heart is connected to your tongue. Because what you think on, what you dwell on, what you continually seem to simmer in here is going to come out of this mouth. And that's why the psalmist was saying, Let, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart hook up together so that when it comes out, it comes out full of praise, it comes out full of power, it comes out of that which will benefit and not tear down. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Secondly, Paul commands us in our text to be an example in what you do. Not just what you say, but what you do. Titus chapter 2 and verse 7. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Let everything reflect the seriousness of what you believe in life. Doing good works of every kind. Matthew 23 and 3. So practice and obey. This, this passage of scripture just blows my mind. I, it really does. I, I just, we'll get into it. So practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. I just can't get over the fact here that Jesus said that these idiots would teach it right, but not live it right, and you were supposed to do what they said and not what they do. I would, I would just look for him to say, go find another congregation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Go find another place. To, but they probably didn't have that ability to do that. They didn't have that ability to move around maybe like we do today. And he was saying that they teach it right. But they don't live it. Their works don't match what they teach. Let me tell you something. The day that your works don't match your teaching and you don't do it in seriousness, you need to get on your knees and ask God for forgiveness. You need to ask God to forgive you for being so self-righteous and for being so into yourself that you have forgotten that it's not you that matters, but his word above all things. Amen? They don't practice. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a pretender. A hypocrite is one that puts on a mask like they did. It, 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 the word hypocrite is from an acting of illustration that in the days when they used to put masks in front of their face and they would go out and they would quote their lines as actors and actors but they would use a mask it was it was a pretense a putting on you don't need and don't live life to pretend don't live life to put on live it because it's in you hallelujah and because you can have the peace of god you cannot have peace and tranquility in your heart when you're a hypocrite Jesus made it clear in this passage to practice that, that a person is living in deception if they're only willing to amen the word of God and fail to amend their ways by practicing what they hear. There's only one letter difference in amen and amen, and it's a D. And many people know how to amen, but not amen what needs to be done. Matthew 5 and 16. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Thirdly, Paul commands us in our text to be an example in what and who you love. In what and who you love. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So here the scripture reminds us of who we are to love. Who? God. We're to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And second under that, you are to love your neighbor. If there's somebody sitting next to you, look at them right for a moment. That's your neighbor. Amen. Your neighbor is not just the 911 address down next from you, even though that's true too. 
but you are to love those next to you. Those who are close proximity to you at that time. Love them as you love yourself. Amen? And when we do that, we will set a good example. The following scripture reminds us of what we are not to love. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love this world or the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. That's some strong statements from John, isn't it? Verse 16. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. In verse 17. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Amen. This, he's telling us, this world is going to give you nothing but heartache, pain in the end. Everything you see, touch, walk on, observe is going to pass away because it's been corrupted by sin. It'll only be when Jesus comes back one day and this thing is burned up in a fiery mass and he remakes it again the way it ought to be. Can we live in it in the beauty and the way that he intended? But yet so many Christians show a bad example by believing that they must crave and work and desire and to receive so many things of this world and they're bogged down with their time. They're bogged down in their spirit. They don't have time for God because now... The world drives everything. And God said, that's not the example that I want you to set. Tommy, if you would come to the piano and get ready for our altar. Listen, lastly, Paul commands us in our text to be an example in what you believe. What you believe. Man, is not the Christian's belief under fire today like it's ever been? I mean, has there ever been a time to when news reports and everything has been set off when somebody took a stand for what they believed? You know, we've seen this week, I can't remember his name, but finally that football coach got to go back to the field and begin to coach football again this year. In fact, this past week or whatever was his first game because he had the audacity several, many years ago, actually now four or five years ago, that when his game ended to kneel on the 50-yard line and pray to God. And because he did that, other football players wanted to come and do that too. And they fired him from his job and told him he couldn't do that. And the Supreme Court come back and said, you're wrong. He can do that. That's his religious rights. Taking a stand for what you believe. This transgender notification stuff in the schools. I was seeing the other day where a group of parents got together and, and read, I think, somewhere around 10 books to the Board of Education in one state. In elementary school. And the reading was so foul and nasty. They shut the parents down. What does that tell you? You got to take a stand. But when you take a stand, they're going to label you as a bigot. They're going to la label you as a racist. I see Riley Gaines, who is a great example to women in the world today. She's been so slandered because she was upset that they allowed a transgender male to be in her dressing room as a swimming person and to have to undress in front of this idiot that simply just wanted to encroach upon women. And she's taken her stand, and she's been made to look like a horned devil. She's been made to look like somebody that's out of touch. She's been scolded. She's been tried to be killed and assassinated. She's been held hostage among people. Be an example in what you believe. You may never, ever get into any circumstance like that ever in your life. But stand your ground. Be ready at any moment or any time to say no. Or yes, whichever it would call to do. 1 Peter 
3 and 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. That's so important. With meekness and in fear. In James 1, 6, Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalties is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. You will never accomplish the things for God that you need to until you settle what's right in the Word of God. And that you settle that that belongs in the bosom of your soul. And whether people hate you, like you, love you, or despise you, God is looking down upon you. God sees the truth. And God takes note when you take a stand. God takes note when you dig in. God takes note when they lob foul and abusive language towards you. God takes note when they speak ill of you to others. Because you know what? We're not here to please men. We're here to set a good example. But we're here to please the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in everything that we do. And if you will take that stand and not be moved, and you will take it in the right spirit and understand that if they do that to you, they've already done it to the Father. If they do that to you, they already did it to Jesus beforehand. And if they're doing it to you because of him, he said you are to be joyful about it. Uh, He said you're to be happy about it because it proves that the spirit and the power and the glory of God rest on you. (laughs) <laughs> Hallelujah. You say, no, that's not what happens in the rest. Well, I know. I know. It seems like everybody's derogatory. They're running down. And everybody else, we don't have nothing to do with them because they're being mis- uh, misaligned. They're being uh, put down. No. And the Lord, when they do that to you, he said, it's a badge of honor. Paul says, I counted it so worthy to suffer for the one who suffered for me. Amen. An example in life. He says, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord who are double-minded. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do if they have a double-mindedness. One more scripture, if you'll just hold with me. Paul commands us in the text to be an example in what we will or will not allow in our life. It's about purity. Young men in this church, stay pure. Do not be defiled by sexual impropriety. Do not be defiled by pornography. Do not be defiled by those things that would desire to ruin your mind and your thoughts and your life. Stand your ground with what you allow through the gate of your soul and the gate of your spirit. Young women, Do the same. Be modest. Be pure. Be holy before the Lord. It's not in vogue. It's not what a lot of the world wants to do, and they try to make it look so much fun that it's irresistible. But it leads to death. It leads to destruction. It leads down a path that you don't want to go. For in the end, it'll show you. Hebrews 12 and 1 is the last scripture. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. The weight, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We got weights and we got sins. We got things that maybe would not be classified as something that was immoral, but it's holding us back. It's keeping us reserved when God wants us to be out there running free with the power of God. If it's a sin, it must go. If it's a sin, it's not in alignment with the new man that's in your spirit because your new man only desires that which is of the spirit, which is of life and which is of truth. Praise God. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you bow your heads all across this land? Listen to me. I have had to get this off of my chest today to share with you to be an example. It's a tall order, people. Children, young teens, adults. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. 
If it was just a snap of the finger, everybody would be doing it, but it takes discipline. Just like the runner, just like the athlete, if they're going to be good at anything they do, they have to train and train hard. Paul said, I'm like a fighter. He said, I don't shatter box. I don't punch at what I know is not there. He said, with every stroke that I do, it has an intent and has a purpose. You have to lay aside some of the things that everybody else is participating in if you want to get strong like the athlete. You can't go some places and do some things and show up and do this or that if you're going to be what God wants you to be. Because it's important. He's coming soon. He's coming. Praise the Lord. If you're here today while heads are bowed, and we're going to have you to come to the altar here in just a second. But if you're here and you say, Pastor Jeff, there's some things in my life that I know the Holy Spirit has even convicted me during this message that I need to turn over to him, that I, I need Pastor Jeff to shine up and to clean up by the word of God, some things that I hadn't really been an example the way that I should. If that's you, would you just slip your hand and say, slip your hand up and say, Pastor Jeff, just pray with me. Yes, I see that. Amen, I see it, I see it. Amen. Somebody else? Yes, I see that hand. Amen. Listen, there's nothing sweeter than responding to the sweet conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing more greater than allowing God to move in your heart and your life. As Miss Tommy begins to sing and praise and worship, I want you from the back of the church to the front to come. I want you to kneel on these altars. Come and pray with me right now. Those of you that lifted your hands, I want you to come right now. We've got to spend time before the Lord right now. We've got to get in His face and let Him strengthen us.